Our next presenter is, Ty is Taylor Ledoux, talking about arc evolution and variability in magmatic porphyry fertility of the Southern Quenelle Arc in South Central British Columbia. Taylor graduated from UBC in 2019. He spent three summers in the Yukon and Northwest Territories doing mineral exploration. He's an MSc student at UBC studying the variability in porphyry fertility of arcs in BC, Arizona, and Chile, and is also a 2020 scholarship recipient. Over to you, Taylor. Uh, thanks, Krista, for the introduction. Um, so just, just also to add that uh, Craig Hart's my supervisor, and, and this research has really benefited from him, as well as Rob Lee, who's not a co-author on this talk, but he's, he's had a lot of input on this project. Um, because I'm still waiting on my trace element and zircon data, this presentation is just going to provide uh, background information on the evolution of the Crudelli arc in late Triassic, early Jurassic plutonism and porphyry metallogeny in southern BC as a foundation for the interpretation of the subsequent analytical results. Before we get into some BC geology, let's talk about the demand for copper. Copper usage has been increasing since the 1900s. And with decarbonization and a shift towards renewable energy and electric vehicles, copper demand will only increase. However, existing mines are starting to run out of reserves, so new discoveries are needed to keep up with the rising demand for copper. Giant porphyry copper deposits are the dominant source of copper, with 12 of the world's 50 largest copper mines being porphyry deposits that account for almost a third of the world's annual copper production. Now let's take a look at what's being done to find the deposits to keep up with demand. So the, the blue line in this figure is the total global exploration spending and the red bars are the total value created from exploration. So there's quite a bit of exploration spending going on, almost 200 billion over the last decade, which delivered only around 100 billion in value, whereas around 200 billion was spent in the two preceding decades, creating almost 500 billion in value. So, so what's going on um, is deposits are deeper or they're concealed under cover rendering conventional exploration methods ineffective. It's also more expensive to explore for deep targets and the infrastructure required to mine a deep deposit is expensive. Therefore, a deep deposit uh, needs to have a large, higher grade resource to be economic. So, so new tools are needed to identify deposits and to assess their economic potential. So time and resources aren't wasted on bad projects. So we've established that the current exploration methods aren't working and the majority of copper deposits are porphyry. So how can we exploit this and explore more efficiently? In the last decade or so, research in mineral chemistry has identified that trace element signatures in zircon and zircon grain morphology are robust indicators of many characteristics related to porphyry magma fertility, and therefore can be used to identify intrusions that have the potential to form economic porphyry mineralization for focused exploration targeting. However, the scale of variability of fertility indicators with an evolving arc, along an arc segment, or across a migrating arc has not been well established and their links to the petrogenetic, magmatic, and tectonic processes that control the magma formation are still in question. Migrant Master's research is focused on establishing the variability of trace elements in zircon within environments in British Columbia, Arizona, and Chile, with the goal of creating a porphyry magma fertility toolbox for industry. Um, but before attempting to understand the porphyry magma fertility of an arc, it is imperative to first understand the regional geology and the variability of plutonism in a district. So Quinelli is composed of the Nicola and Roslin group Mesozoic Allen Arc assemblages that are unconformably overlie Paleozoic Okanagan and Harper Ranch Oceanic and Island Arc subterrains. Eastern Quinelli is unconformable on the Oceanic Slide Mountain Train and Perry Kutonic Kootenai Train. And Mesozoic Oceanic Creek Train is then faulted against the western margin of Quinelli. The main component of the Quinelli Arc is the Nicola group. Uh, but before I discuss the Nicola group, I should make it clear that this geological understanding and the concepts of volcanic and plutonic belts in southern Quinellia was first started by mapping done by Prato in 1979, which is expanded north by Macmillan, Monger, and Mortimer in the 80s, and then really refined and expanded upon by Paul Cherise in particular, in addition to James Logan, Mitch Mohanic, and others at the BCGS more recently. Construction of the arc started in the Middle Triassic with the deposition of basinal sedimentary rocks and lesser volcanic plastic and basaltic rocks. As the arc developed in the late Triassic, volcanic sandstones and conglomerates were deposited with calc alkaline to coalitic subaerial basaltic flows and breaches. Volcanism peaked in the Norian and transitioned towards a more alkaline affinity with basaltic flows intercalated with lesser volcanic plastic and sedimentary rocks. Normal subduction stalled in the ration, resulting in arc uplift and the deposition of polymic conglomerates with class of the plutonic rocks and fewer volcanic and volcanic classic rocks that maintain a more alkaline affinity. The magmatic axis of late Triassic to early Jurassic Quinellia plutonism migrated episodically eastward, constructing three subparallel linear 
plutonic axes over an approximately 36 million year period. Most Grinelli porphyry deposits formed in a particularly prolific 50 million year time span from 210 to 195 MA. The western axis is characterized by late Triassic, large, thick, composite and zone calc alkaline granodiorite and tonalite sweet batholiths that host copper moly porphyry deposits. The central axis is characterized by latest Triassic to early Jurassic smaller, shallowly placed composite alkaline cyanite to diorite sweet plutons and intrusive complexes that host gold rich copper gold deposits. The eastern axis is characterized by early Jurassic, large, composite and zone calc alkaline to high K calc alkaline granite iron and quartz diorite with local monza granite sweet bathless that hosts copper moly and copper gold deposits. This table summarizes the characteristics of each axis, including the major porphyry districts and the amount of contained copper. Most of the copper is uh, produced in southern Quinale comes from the western axis and the eastern axis has the least amount of proven contained copper and the central axis currently has the largest remaining copper resource. So now let's get to the exciting part, uh, porphyry magma fertility. Uh, so formation of an economic porphyry copper deposit is dependent on these six key magmatic parameters. To be considered fertile and capable of generating an economic deposit, the magma needs to be oxidized, have cooled at the right temperature and have high water, metal, chlorine and sulfur contents. Recent research has identified proxies in zircon chemistry that correlate with some of these parameters. So this is depicted in the schematic diagram here where early intrusions with decreasing europium values and hotter temperatures are barren and the later intrusion with consistently high European values and lower cooling temperatures are fertile. So in, in the last few years, there have been some really good uh, detailed studies of trace elements in zircon from the Tacoma Cane, Guchan Creek, and Granite Mountain Bathless in studies conducted by Farad Buzari, Rob Lee, and Christopher Kobolinski. I'll be showing some figures from an MDRU geoscience species study led by Farhad Buzari. So in all the following figures, zircons from the youngest units are cooler temperatures and uh, the progressively uh, cooler temperatures are from the older units. The square symbols denote units that have been identified as the cause of intrusions with the most significant mineralization. And the diamond symbols represent unmineralized or weakly mineralized units. So in the figure on the left here of thorium over uranium versus ytterbium over gadolinium, which are used to indicate the degree of fractionation. Uh, so during fractional crystallization, thorium over uranium decreases and ytterbium over gadolinium increases because of the varying degrees of element compatibility in minerals crystallizing from a magma. So at Guchang Creek, all the units define a curved fractionation trend with the younger units being the most fractionated, indicating that fractional crystallization was the dominant magmatic process going on. In the center figure, uh, zircons from the older barren units display a trend of a decreasing europium anomaly, which is used as a proxy for magma oxidation state as the hafnium concentration increases, which is used as, to indicate cooling and crystallization of a magma. Whereas the younger fertile intrusions have a consistently higher europium anomaly uh, with increasing hafnium, indicating that normal cooling did not influence the oxidation state of the fertile intrusions. And in this figure on the right here uh, shows the zircon crystallization temperature using the titanium and zircon thermometer versus hafnium. And the fertile intrusions define a cooling trend below the wet granite solidus. Um, and, the hotter and the older intrusions define a hotter temperature trend. Uh, in Tacoma Cane Bathlet, which is in the eastern axis, uh, the older units define a closed crystal fractionation trend, similar to what we saw at Guchang Creek. However, there's not this systematic progression of increasing fractionation from the barren older to the mineralizing younger intrusions. Also, the youngest units in the Bathlet have a scattered fractionation path with lower thorium over uranium and elevated ytterbium over gadolinium. Uh, then the, that's probably due to melts uh, assimilating more evolved crustal materials during magma evolution in, in these younger intrusions. Uh, similar to Gushan Creek, zircons from the older barren units display this trend of a decreasing magma oxidation state with cooling and crystallization, where the, the younger fertile intrusions uh, don't display this trend, uh, in, in indicating normal cooling did not influence uh, oxidation state in the fertile intrusions. However, the, the younger schoolhouse lake and the quartz feldspar porphyry also have high European anomalies, but they don't uh, demonstrate high uh, significant porphyry mineralization. And that could be because these magmas have significant crustal contamination as, as we saw earlier, uh, which isn't really favorable for forming porphyry copper deposits. And then looking at the, the temperature plot here, uh, zircons from the Spelt Lake Pluton, which is actually part of the alkaline central magmatic axis are higher temperature. And zircons from all the younger intrusions, uh, not discriminated between the mineralized and non-mineralized have uh, lower temperature 
uh, zircon temperatures. Uh, so pretty much what I'm going to do to complement the existing studies, we focused on collecting rock, till, and stream samples that reflect the regional plutonic variability within and between the three magmatic axes of the southern Cornelli arc. And we're going to focus on the central magmatic axis where there currently aren't any trace element and zircon results published. We collected detrital zircons to test the effectiveness as a faster and cost-effective exploration tool with the hopes of obtaining zircons from weakly silica saturated intrusions that have proven difficult to get zircons from. Uh, so I'm currently in the process of extracting zircons to analyze uh, by LAICPMS. Uh, after this, I'll be characterizing the magmatic fertility of each magmatic axis in the arc and identifying what magmatic processes are influencing the formation of porphyry copper deposits to determine what mineral chemistry signatures in zircon are expressed by these processes. And then this will be used to establish strategies and methods to make using trace elements in zircon easier, cheaper, and faster for industry in the form of a porphyry magma fertility exploration toolbox. Uh, so thanks for listening and thanks Geoscience BC and SCG Canada Foundation for sponsoring part of this research. And if you have any questions, you can ask now or you can feel free to send me an email.